Okay, cool. Thank you all for these great questions. Um, I'll just kind of go through them. I'll say, I don't know, I'll just, you know, and then we, I'll say a few things about what comes to mind and then we can open it up and, you know, hear from each other as well. All right, so the first one, um, are all of the voices you talked about, Freud, the French people, the author, based on their position that there is no God, right? So, okay, what about, what about God, right? So it seems like all the people you're talking about actually don't believe, believe in God, right, in the sense of, of the reality of God. And yeah, that's right. Freud did not, Freud ultimately was a, was a kind of atheist who didn't believe in God. And um, I mean, it, it's th the question about people like Lacan and Kristeva is an interesting question because if you ask them, well, are you an atheist? I don't think they would have an uncomplicated answer to that question. They would, in some ways, they would want to trouble the question itself and the very categories that we work with, you know, these categories of atheism and theism. And I think one of the interesting things about that, this kind of line of thinking is, is it tries to, tr is tr to disturb some of the kind of binary thinking around atheism and theism. Um, that, that's, that's a too simple distinction because you're thinking about God, what God might mean too simply. Um, I mean, the, the, the easy question to always throw back at any atheist is, well, which God don't you believe in? Do you know what I mean? And in some ways, that's a cheeky, unhelpful response. But, it's a, but, it, but it points to something, right? You're an atheist. Okay, well, which theism are you, A, negating, right? Like, so atheism and theism, I think these thinkers would, would kind of trouble them. Certainly, if any kind of divine or sacred or, or God they would believe in would not be the, what, what a lot of people would think of as the kind of traditional, transcendent, person-like God, you know, out there, right? Um, it would be a very different sense of God or the divine or the sacred. Now, the second part of this question is in the connection of this to apophatic theology, which I didn't really get to because that's the part of my project that I'm working on, right? <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm trying to make the connections between this and apophatic theology. Um, there's certainly a form of apophatic theology, I think, that would grade against this. Um, if there is a form of apophatic theology that could work with this, it would, again, it would be a form that would find the unsayable, the unknowable, um, like all entangled up with everything that is. Um, so traditional apophatic or negative theology kind of negates everything that can be known about God and it also kind of is also associated with this kind of mystic journey kind of in a way out of, well, some versions of it, out of relation and sometimes out of embodiment into this kind of unknown kind of mystical realm, right? There's a very a, a kind of trajectory of mystical theology and, or apophatic negative theology that moves along those lines. I'm interested in the apophatic theology that finds the kind of unnameable, unknowable, divine or sacred, again, precisely kind of within our entanglements. Not just our human entanglements, but potentially all of our entanglements with the earth, with the universe. So there's a theologian in the US named Catherine Keller. Maybe some of you, anyone read anything by Catherine Keller? Maybe some of, so she's got a book called Cloud of the Impossible, Negative Theology and Planetary Entanglement that tries to think apophatic negative theology just along those lines. She doesn't talk much about psychoanalysis, and part of my question would be, how do you take something like what Catherine Keller's doing in that work and expand it out to include a, a kind of psychoanalytic dimension to it? So, but yeah, the question of, you know, again, I'll, I'll leave that, right? Like, I'm, I'm neither trying to defend the existence of God, nor am I trying to undefend the existence of God, right? I'm, I'm, I want to do neither of those things and to kind of leave that an open, open question. Um, another one, explain the story of Job in terms of these psychoanalytic understandings of the unknowable. Yes, of course. Um, yes, so like I will not sit here and give you a whole disquisition on the book of Job, but absolutely, you can entirely read the book of Job, right? Um, I mean, again, think about, the. I mean, one, I'll just say one thing. One of the fascinating things about the book of Job is that God and the accuser, right, who, wh wh which we translate Satan, whatever, it's not the Satan, John Milton, Paradise Lost Satan. It's a God and the accuser are like together, right? They're kind of scheming at the beginning, right? And this points to, again, that like th this realm of the divine or the sacred is both like good and evil are both mixed up there, right? It's both this alluring and this kind of unnerving thing, right? And that the kind of 
tragedy and devastation that, you know, visits Job comes from the hand of God, from the hand of the accuser, both. Um, and that, yeah, that, and that Job then, the end of the book of Job, does Job get any kind of real answers at the end of the book of Job? No, he doesn't really. He sees God in the whirlwind. And again, it's this fundamental, it's, it's this confrontation with the enigmatic, overwhelming nature of existence, life itself. Um, and that's kind of where, that's where Job ends up. So absolutely, you could do it. And, there, and that's been, this has been done. There's all kinds of interesting readings of Job along these lines. What about Carl Jung? Yes, so Jung, Jung is the sort of other dimension of, and, and y- in fact, Jung is the more, w- when people talk about religion and theology and psychoanalysis, they, t- they typically talk about Jung, right? Carl Jung is the kind of, initially Freud and Jung were friends, then they had this split um, where they disagreed w- with each other, um, and Jung went his own way and Freud went his own way. Jung was, again, much more, Freud was this kind of, you know, deep critic of religion. Um, Jung was much more open to religion, um, and, 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 and they had very different understandings of the unconscious. You know, Jung thought that kind of all, you know, he talks about archetypes and all universal and religious archetypes are kind of in the unconscious. Um, and that, that religion is one place in which these kind of fundamental human archetypes are worked out. So yes, th- there's Jung. I, I don't know, I, you know, it's an interesting question. I, I'm simply not drawn as much as I am to the kind of Jungian side of things. I'm more interested in what kind of interesting things you could do with religion from the kind of Freudian line of psychoanalysis. I'm just not as interested in the kind of union. I don't know. I have to think, like, I, have, I think I have answers to that, but I won't go into them now. Um, if the core of Christianity is love of neighbor and even of our enemy, is our core business to overcome um, an innate fear of the other? Right? Is that the, and in its sh- in short, yeah, absolutely. I think that's exactly what this is saying, right? That, that, um, that we're, the, the human psyche is, is structured, kind of structured around this kind of attraction to, but also revulsion from the other, right? The otherness of others, but also the otherness of ourselves, right? And this, again, this is one of the interesting things about, you know, psychoanalysis. And again, from its more therapeutic dimension, one way to talk about the aims of undergoing psychoanalysis is to, you know, give you a space where you can come into contact with yourself as an other, um, with yourself as kind of strange and unnerving, um, and that you can kind of slowly welcome those parts of yourself and, and forge a relationship to those parts of yourself that you once thought were, that you had to sort of hide or repress or whatever, right? Um, and that the idea is that if you know, o- overcoming a certain revulsion of the otherness of oneself also m- enables you to enter into relationships where you're not as defensive against the strange and enigmatic dimensions of, of the other. All right, anyone have any, it's just me talking. Does anyone else want to throw, throw in some thoughts about any of those questions? Yes. Yep. And, and I'm like, wow, that speaks more than um, a- any, anything that you know, I can hear from a sermon or read in a book or, or whatever. That to me seems very real. And, and you know, to a little bit extent, times and things in my life where I think, okay, that's, that's how I know that God is real, through, through that experience. And um, I think for people who kind of 
Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it, I suppose like, I mean, one, I'd want to ask about, okay, so, you know, that the sort of confidence in faith is rooted in these sort of experiences of encounter with God. Um, again, I, there, there's certain a kind of line of modern thinking, even psychological, psychoanalytic thinking that would just want to be dismissive about that. We're not dismissive or, or critical, right? Okay, what are they, tell me more about these so-called experiences, right? And let's, let's actually break them down and what do you claim a has actually happened and, and can you account for them in some other way, right? So I, th I certainly think that's possible, right? And one, one way you could go with that. So there's also a kind of less, I don't know, less aggressively you know, dismissive way of, of remaining open to what these, to this experience, like, tell me more about this experience and let's be open to it and think about it without the need to simply locate it as, well, this is what's really happening in your experience and let me explain it away. So I think there's different ways and I would want to be more relatively open, but while still, you know, still wanting to raise some critical questions because again, one of the, I mean, religions, all religions, not just Christianity, all religions are full of claims of my God, our God did these extraordinary things and therefore my God, our God is the only true God. And everyone else's God is not the true God because our God did this and I experienced it and we experienced it. And I think, and that's not, everyone says that. Do you know what I mean? So everyone says that. And either everyone is right, and we live in a very strange universe, or everyone is wrong, and we live in a differently strange universe, or something in between. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, was there a hand over here? Yeah. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. I totally agree. And that's one thing I'm, that's the sort of area I'm interested in thinking about, you know. I mean, I will say, you know, you said, I mean, yes, to a certain, you know, certainly Freudian scientific side would say the kind of unmeasurable, unobservable, and therefore, you, you know, we can't. But, but again, but part of the, even within Freud and the larger tradition of psychoanalysis is precisely to try to give language to something that's in a way not measurable. The unconscious for Freud is not measurable. It's not directly observable. It's only, d it's, it's through speech, it's through s slips of the tongue, it's, you know, so it, there's, again, there's a, there is a whole conversation b between psychoanalysis an and science that's been a very conflicted conversation. Sometimes science itself says psychoanalysis, scientific <coughs> trends dismiss psychoanalysis because it's like, it's its own weird mystical thing, you know, talking about the unconscious and we're just want to talk about observable human behavior and, you know, and, you know, so psychoanalysis in, is in a way, for me, interestingly caught between modern scientific critique and 
yeah, rationalism and mystical religious theological experience. It's interestingly caught in trying to get at certain human phenomena that that pull in both directions, right? Yeah, and that, and it has, right? Um, and again, I'm interested in kind of again, just like breaking down some of the kind of just uninteresting stale binaries between theism and atheism, breaking down some of the stale binaries between religious and secular is also what I think some of these thinkers help us help us to do. This right, so there were a few questions about neuroscience, about neurobiology and psychoanalysis. And just to say, yeah, this is a whole, um, again, this is a whole body of literature of, you know, and clearly Freud, Freud operated, thought of himself as a scientist, but clearly Freud was wrong about a lot of things scientifically, right? He had all kinds of theories about how, you know, the body works and about how s energy moves through the body and had this whole kind of hydraulic theory of energy and how it in interacts with the mind and the drives and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of that has been shown. No, Freud was just wrong, right, about all kinds of things, right? So there's a, um, but there's also a whole, there's a lot of neuroscience and a lot of neurobiology that is actually confirming, at least in broad strokes, yeah, the mind does have unconscious processes, right? That, that, that what we talk about is consciousness and even how the brain functions is what we experience as consciousness is actually a very minute, <laughs> small portion of everything that's going on for us psychically in the brain mentally. Um, so there's a lot of, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's still a very much an emerging field. And again, it's a very contested field, um, but there's a lot there's a lot there. So in broad strokes, yeah, like I think there's an ongoing conversation that, that even current, very current kind of breakthroughs and understandings about neuroscience are giving us a picture of the human being that in a way resonates with the broad strokes of a psychoanalytic claim that of, about the unconscious and about the sort of what the human person is or is not. Um, one, if this is, I like, I like this question a lot. If it is just all about love, is religion then not anthropocentric? I think this is a great question. If it's all about love, right, if it's just about, is it not s anthropocentric, right? Isn't just about all about human beings, right? And I think this is, I think this is right. And in a certain sense, yes. Because in a certain sense, I don't think human beings cannot but be anthropocentric. Like, I think in some ways, this is part of our, like, this is how, we've, how we function, right? Th that even in our relationships to the kind of quote unquote natural world, the world outside of humanity, we can't help but inscribe them within kind of anthropocentric kind of myths and images, right? We, we, we anthropomorphize the universe in all kinds of ways. And we, we, you know, and again, this is part of, we, we can't get outside of our kind of psychic interaction with the world from a human perspective. So yeah, so I think there is something fundamentally anthropocentric about, in a way, all meaning-making systems that humans generate. Now, of course, you can, there's better and worse versions of it, right? There's, the, there's like the worst forms of anthropocentrism or the human being is the only thing we should care about to hell with everything else. Right, we'll just you know destroy the natural world. We'll you know not care at all about the other than human animal world. And then there's less violent forms of anthropocentrism. So, um, in which we try to acknowledge in our limited ways that things exist other than human beings. So, and what what it might mean to extend love, th and the love that I was talking about there, where what it's the strange openness to the strange and enigmatic dimension of the other, to extend that love even beyond human beings, I think is a, great, is a great question, especially in a kind of ecological crisis age in which we live. So, yeah, that's great. Um, neuroscience, yeah, how does the unconscious fit in the explosion of neurobiology and the understanding of memories? Again, I mean, memory is a huge, you know, it's a huge domain within um, psychoanalysis. So yes, that's absolutely, there's lots of interesting research going on. All right, I think I've, I think I've, did anyone put down a question that we didn't talk about? Or is there any new questions that you want to, that you want to, that you want to raise? Yes, I see a hand.
Yeah, so someone who's who's someone who's sort of, you know, through you said dementia or a traumatic brain injury and who's because of that is kind of losing some part of themselves that included kind of faith as an important that important part um what would I say to them? I mean, I like I would I don't know like I, I'm not sure I'm not sure I would say anything radically different than what I would say to anyone who's caring for anyone, you know, which is attune yourself to the particular person in front of you um, and to what's going on for them um, and to try to support them and their in as best way that you can. And if that support looks like no longer expecting them to be, say, you know, again, I have no idea what you're talking about in my imagination. Say they were like some, you know, stalwart person of faith, you know, leader of the church community, and that somehow because of what something that's happened to them, they just have lost that part of themselves, right? And they can no longer, they, you know, no longer believe or can believe. I think, you know, accepting that this is now who they are and loving them precisely for who they are would be the important, most important thing. And not demanding that they conform to any kind of idealized vision that you would have of them or that they would even have of themselves. That's what I would say. And again, it's, it's, it's the, which is the same thing I would say to it, caring for anybody. Keep going, no, keep going, yes. Yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah, sure. You know, and and I think yeah, in Colossians it says, our identity is in the in Christ, but our life is hidden with Christ in God. Right. This line, again, which then that's an apophatic, interesting theme there. You know, the sense that our being in Christ again is not something that we have full, you know, m control over. Right. If you want to talk about, uh, we're hidden. Also, you know, in the Galatians, when Paul says, um, when he says, you. Know, I have come to know God, and then he stops himself, and he says, or rather, to be known by God. This is a very interesting, Paul, he says, I've come to know God, or, right, or rather, I've come to be known by God. It's this reversal that what's most important for f is not that I have some kind of, consci again, conscious belief, and that that's what secures anything for me, but that I'm, again, I'm held in a greater environment and known by a greater environment, and that's what's most important. So again, and I think that's, that's what's that and that's what makes us human what makes us human and again this has to do with again it's not it's not the things that we can perform as individuals it's the social links and contexts in which we're held that make us human for better and for worse so and and, and again to think to rethink god along those lines god god is the as, as a name for a kind of social being known and holding <laughs> 